My name is Chris Little. I am the host of the Lifestyle Chase podcast. This is season five. I'll get us started. So welcome back to the Lifestyle Chase podcast. And it's crazy because basically the last time our guest today, Jordan Sai, was on the show, I was putting out episodes like crazy. I probably put out like two to three episodes a week. And then this past year, I've been so busy that I've actually been doing like maybe one episode a month. But super, super pumped to have you back, Jordan. I think the last time you were on the show was August 2021. Wow. And the time before that was October 2019. So for people who really want to piece things together, they can go back to those episodes. They can hear my career progress. You can hear Gordon's progressions because a lot of people can gain value from going back in people's careers. Um, But first and foremost, how are you doing today? Dude, I'm great, man. I'm great. I had a good day so far. I woke up, hung out with my wife and daughter, went to jujitsu, came back, hung out with my wife and daughter. Did a, a call with people in my mentorship group. Then uh, my wife took my daughter out. She has an appointment. So I just went outside, got like 30 minutes in the sun, a little walk in between calls. Now I've got this and then one more podcast after this. And then we're we'll making some Instagram content after that. So a busy day, but a very good day. Love it. And the thing that I really liked was just how you made time to travel this year. I'm just kind of seeing you just step away from the hustle and bustle and sort of make the life side of things a priority because I think that's important for people in any industry and I think sometimes we forget to kind of integrate that into our life so Mm. love seeing you lead by example in that way and one of the things that I was super fired up to talk about on this episode is seeing as how our last conversation was August 2021 in that time I have started doing jujitsu let's go nice man how do you like it I love it. I love it. So I got my gi in the background. So almost like as a prop, um, as a shout out to Frontline, Carlson Gracie. Um, And a lot of the people that I train with know who you are, Jordan. So they'll be fired up to see this episode. Let's go. And yeah, just mindset wise, game changer. Last time you were on the show, we talked a lot about mental health. Um, It's my industry friends that encouraged me to do jujitsu. I think you've you've talked to Dean Guido before. I always got to give him a shout out. Dean got me yeah. into doing jujitsu. Nice. And so I it's love just that. Super cool. How like these connections can kind of form. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I love it because it's kind of one of those modalities where you can just shut off everything. Yes. And it tests you to start from the, like every single time you got to be willing to get your ass kicked. Even if you start yeah. to progress and stuff. It's like, okay, well, I'm, I am the nail today once again. <laughs> so but, you've been doing it just under two years now? Oh, no. Like I started in 2022. So some okay. time had passed. And then after, like the funny thing is I always in the back of my mind had this feeling that I'd probably enjoy a sport like that because I seem to be able to embrace the struggle. Mm. Like my training career, there's always like little hiccups and setbacks and stuff. And I just kept persevering. So I was like, if anybody could like this sport, I feel like I would. And I was nervous to start because I had like these nagging injuries and just discomforts in my shoulders and hips and everything. And like, I thought that I'd have to like do something to get ready for that, which is funny because we hear that so much in like the general population when it comes to strength training. And just with regards to like, I have to get fit before I see a trainer or I have to get to a certain level. And so what ended up happening is that I just got basically peer pressured into it. That's like the simplest way to explain it. And yeah, I signed up. I knew somebody at the place that I went to, uh, cause Dean, he trains 20 minutes North of me. So we're okay. at different spaces, but we've actually been able to go to a seminar together. So it's kind of cool how you can interweave your journeys with friends. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, I went to that first class, got tossed around like a rag doll, felt just completely helpless. A second class. It's funny because I've been reflecting on this and just my own progression. I tapped out because I was winded. <laughs> like like yep. not because I was injured or like my position was compromised. It was because I was winded and tired. 
Uh, so just kind of funny. And it, it's funny, like I'm sweating right now and it's not because I'm walking. It's because we're having a heat wave uh, in Canada <laughs> right now. So my condo is really, really hot. So that's, if anybody's watching, they might see that. If they're listening, just don't worry about it. But nonetheless, that is. Yeah, I, I sweat. I sweat just peeling an orange. Like it doesn't yeah. have. Like, it could be freezing, and I'd be sweating. I just. I sweat all the time. So, sweat doesn't necessarily mean exertion. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, what at what point in the day did you do your jujitsu class? Like how how much time has passed since you finished up your class today? Um, so I did it from today was 11 to 12 and it's three o'clock now. So about three hours or so. Nice. Nice. Yeah. For me, like I'm still, I've got like that adrenaline rush. Cause basically I finished up the class and an hour after I left the building, we started our call. So I had just enough time to shower and get over here. But I was like, I'm not going to skip class that day. Cause I'm going to take that energy and put yeah. it in the podcast. What did, what did you drill today? What'd you work on in class? Uh, today was basically, see, I don't know the technical term, so I'm not even okay. going to try them, but I basically, I would hold on to the partner's head, bring myself around and then try to collect the arm. But then you'd have to like use your other hand to like uh, lever because they're hooking their own hand. So okay. you have to lever your hand in there to kind of like separate it. Yep. So you're talking about like trying to break an arm bar. So get an arm bar, break their grips, and then you can isolate the arm to, to essentially break it. Yeah, pretty much. So and you're it's on the ground. So like you essentially yeah. you step around like you're in top side control. You weave your arm under theirs. You step around their head, come to the other side, and then you have an arm bar. Then you got to break their grips. Yeah, and just kind of it was a drill where we had to maintain pressure on like their upper body kind of thing, and just the positioning of like our knee and our foot and everything was paramount so that they couldn't just like toss us right off. Love that, love that, man. That's amazing, dude. That's I'm so happy you're doing it. And you're enjoying it. Well, it's good because it's like, I find that when we bring this into the conversation, because last time we talked about therapy and counseling, and then this time we're talking about jujitsu. So two bald guys talking about jujitsu, trying to make it more accessible to other people who might benefit from it. Yes, yes. Um, and I even, I signed up for my first tournament in February. Let's so go. Did that. That's awesome. Planning to do more. The next one we had, it got canceled. Um, because of a logistics thing. So I'll have to find another one to go into, but I just like trying to push myself to get better with that. How'd your first competition go? I got based on Kamurad. And okay. so like in two minutes I was done, but the dude that I went against was just like a brick shit host. Like he was solid. Yeah. And, like he, yeah. he won our category. I creeped his stats, just solid athlete. Um, he was like, let's be friends. And it's like, I'll see you at the next one. I'm like, how could you even be mad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't it so funny? It's, like, dude, dude so some, awesome. of my, some of my best friends are, are guys who I've competed against. And yeah. actually the other day I was on the phone. There's a guy named Jarrett Connor. I've faced him two times now. Um, we're, he's from California. He's an amazing, amazing competitor. And uh, he was competing this past weekend and he had to cut a lot of weight. So he just called me. He's like, bro, I need help. I helped him make weight for his competition. It's like, sometimes it's funny. The nerves are the worst right before you step on the mat. As soon as you bump hands, the nerves tend to go away. And mm -hmm. once the match is over, you give him a hug and you're, you tend to be friends after that. It's, it's yeah. actually really nice. Well, it's a good segue to something that I wanted to bring up in our conversation today. So I've been finding that ever since all the shenanigans of the last two years, people have been lacking like that sense of connection, mm. especially dudes. Like, because I can speak from the experience of a dude being a dude. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, guys don't always have like a space where they can go to like just connect with people on like mm -hmm. a really raw level. Just where it's like, look, man, is your day shit? Okay, let's roll. <laughs> and it's like finding ways to make each other better in more of like a, like a grassroots way instead of being like, okay, well, to be better, you got to get these shingles for your house or to be better, get this rate on your mortgage or whatever no it's like this is how you're not gonna die <laughs> like this is how somebody's not going to choke you out and don't extend your arm here or do extend your arm there and it's like this whole new like layer of guys helping each other out in life and guys mm -hmm. being there for each other um and that's where i found jujitsu to be very valuable because what i've observed as someone who tends to observe a lot of things is just people are struggling in the years mm. since all the, the pandemic stuff, just the isolation, the 
I notice people become more insecure because of social media. People get wrapped up over what they see on the internet. And the truth is most of the stuff on the internet isn't even real, like in some way, shape or form. Like Exactly right. We're just trying, we're competing for attention, but the things that we're putting out to get attention, sometimes it's not genuine. Sometimes it's AI and sometimes it's truly just like 10% of our experience of the day and people compare. And so my hope is to put the message out there to be like, hey, like quit getting so wrapped up on the internet and start taking that time away from it and making like very real connections. Because if we get too wrapped up in that stuff, like people are going to start arguing with each other worse than before, Mm -hmm. finding reasons not to get along, finding reasons not to be successful, finding reasons not to get started. But yeah, like, because jujitsu is one way, but then you recently did that uh, Pilates or what What was it? <laughs> I uh, did the Zoom, Zumba class. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was so, actually very fun. <laughs> how, how did that go for you? Because like, A, I'll, I'll give you some backstory to how I could really relate to that. My start in the fitness industry was working for Yeg Fitness Magazine. Okay. So Yeg is the airport code for Edmonton. Uh, okay. And what I did was basically I would go to all the different studios and make connections with the owners, get to know a bunch of trainers. This was before I was certified. I was working full-time in a warehouse and this was like the thing that I did part-time outside of the full-time job. Okay. And because of that, I tried bar classes, Pilates classes, trampoline class, spin classes, camp classes, every, everything. And so I got that kind of exposure before I got ingrained into like the training lane. And Mm. even before I was a trainer, I was a spin instructor for a year. Um, And I got so much value from that. So when I saw you trying something else, I was like, yeah, because it's like, it's great to get exposure in all these different fitness modalities. So what was your experience? Like, what were your biggest takeaways? Yes, yeah, so there. I mean, the reason I did it, I, I've never taken a Zumba class before. I had never thought I would. Uh, but as you know, I do Q and A's all the time on my store, on my Instagram. And every time someone's asking me, "Hey, what do you think of Zumba? What do you think of Orange Theory? What do you think of CrossFit? What do you think of all this stuff?" and usually I wouldn't reply because I've never tried them. Like I can give my thoughts based off of what I see, but I was like, you know what? Fuck it. And I put out my story and I said, who would like to see me take a Zumba class and then have my thoughts, give my thoughts and an overwhelming response. People were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think part of a lot of people thought it would be funny and other people like, yeah, I teach Zumba. I'd love to see you do it. Uh, So I did it and it it was a blast, man. It was was a really good, people were super welcoming and very kind. It was very fun. The music was upbeat. The teacher was fantastic. Uh, And it's funny, like they were all very surprised. Number one, like it's a dance, it's dancing. Um, And I think like, thank God my mom made me take dance classes when I was a kid uh, because I I was actually, I I feel I was pretty good. We're going to have a YouTube video come out so people can judge my, my dance skills for themselves. But uh, thank God for jujitsu because my conditioning is very good. So I wasn't really getting tired and uh, people were actually really impressed with that. Uh, but the, the biggest takeaway is just it, it's a great form of movement. And, and it's funny because I feel like I sort of, and most people in the fitness industry, I think probably have a similar start, especially in the science-based industry, which the science-based industry, I consider myself a part of it, but it can be pretty douchey. Like the science-based industry can be pretty douchey and condescending and like, well, actually, if we look at the research, like this is optimal, shut the fuck up. Like (laughs) there's a lot of douchebags and douchebaggery within the science-based world. And the reality is you can't question the benefit of movement. I mean, that's why you're, you're doing steps right now. You're not speed walking. You're not on an incline. You're just slowly moving. And there are so many benefits to that. So if we're looking at overall health, I think number one, movement is is definitely among the most important. Community is another unbelievably important component of that. And there are so many amazing components that Zumba brought to an overall healthy lifestyle that like I, I there's nothing to hate on. It's great. Do I think it's complete, like it's all anybody should ever do? No, I'd like to see someone strength training as well and doing other stuff. But I mean, man, there were some 60, 70, 80 year olds in this class who were fucking moving. And yeah. they didn't stop. Yeah. And I'm like, I know 60, 70, 80 year olds 
who only strength train who don't move anything like those people in Zumba. And it's like, it is Zumba all encompassing? No. Is strength training all encompassing? No. Is running a marathon all encompassing? No. Is jujitsu all encompassing? No. Like there, there are each modality has certain benefits and each modality has certain drawbacks. And I think as a coach, it's our job to figure out number one, what does the person like the most? What can they do the most and do it consistently because they enjoy it? And then how can we enter, how can we inject the things that maybe they don't like as much within their week or throughout their training that may not, might not take up that much time, but will also help prevent against it will at least give them the things that they're missing that they're not doing elsewhere. And so from an overall health perspective and enjoyment, like I thought Zumba was great. Um, and I couldn't encourage people to do it more. I think it's a, a fantastic community, a fantastic way to get some, some cardio in and movement in. And yeah, I, I liked it a lot. Well, you brought up some really good points that remind me of a few things. First and foremost that I'll focus on is the demographic of people who are like 70 years and plus. And I picked that age group because that's like my parents' age. Yep. And so when I go out to visit my parents, one of our things that we do is we go for a walk together. So they have a clearing of trees in their backyard area. Like they're on a farm slash acreage. So part of it is that they have experienced firsthand the value of movement. Hmm. So they're good at working and staying busy, but that little bit of like cardiovascular work in that extended period of time walking, it benefits their heart health, their mental health. Like, like parents are just like their kids in the sense that they have weaknesses too, and they have things that break them down and they have, we're all like in this together, just trying to do our very best at the start of every day. And so with that said, like when I am promoting fitness to my parents, where you'd think you'd be like almost softer to your parents or kinder and stuff. I'm like almost going like full Goggins with that. Yeah. It's just like, from my experience, if you are able to do as much as you can in your day for as long as possible, like I think that's like the sweet sauce to increasing your quality of life as late into life as possible. And that's like, that's super important to me now. It has never been more important to me. And then I look at clients that I've worked with remotely and I'm looking at ways that we can do the exact same thing to them, for them, transposing it into the activities that they seem to get the most excited about. I had one client uh, based in Michigan where she really liked bird watching. And so we just, I'd be like, okay, I need you to send me some pictures of the birds that you see. Because she's going to have to walk to get to the birds. Exactly, yeah. And she's excited about it. But it's just like what I have found is that because we've gotten so used to like sedentary lifestyles, we almost like feel like it's dangerous to encourage people to move more, like to exercise more, to like work hard, to hit a point of exertion where you sweat because like, oh, they're getting old. You've got to be careful. And like, yeah, they're getting old. Send it. <laughs> um, and it's just because when people point out just the difference in lifestyle, like the best comparison that I've seen is life in North America versus life in Europe. Whereas if we travel to Europe or basically anywhere outside of North America, for the most part, it's so much easier to walk places mm -hmm. yep. and walking places is almost like yeah, that's the norm. And then here, like specifically in Edmonton, our sidewalks don't even connect. <laughs> like you get to the end of the sidewalk it stops and then there's a freeway and it's like oh, yeah, how am yeah, i gonna yeah. get there <laughs> i don't know i guess i die like um so it's just it's not built for us to succeed and you can order anything from uber eats doordash all that stuff like we actually don't have to move in order to survive and so then that's why it's almost like I'm finding it's more and more valuable for trainers and coaches to find innovative, unique ways to make movement normal again. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just so crazy that we've gotten to that point. But at the same time, it's, I mean, anybody can get, get caught in the trap. Like I know for myself, when they close the gyms, like I didn't have any reason to move. So I had to start like coming up with reasons. Like I started walking to a coffee shop, not because I didn't have coffee, but because if I had to walk to one, that meant I was walking that day. Yes. And yep. then, yeah, like after that, I started investing in more like home equipment and stuff just to try and like put some like 
systems in place so that even if I just wasn't feeling that good that day, I'd have, it would be hard for me not to be active. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Makes total sense. So with all of this, what have been your observations with regards to just people's generally general activity level? Do you feel like we need to make like, do you feel like people are moving less? Do you feel like people are moving the same as they always have? Do you feel like people are moving more kind of what's your, what's your hot take on that? It's not even just what I think. Like it's a fact people are moving less, like more than ever people are Mm -hmm. moving less. I think there's many, many reasons for it. You just hit on some of them. Ease of ease of access is a big one, but I think the Dude, it's so funny. Like my wife, daughter, and I, we were just on a a long vacation. And one thing that my wife and daughter and I, we do all like we try and walk together as often as we can, at least several times a week. We're going on long, long, long walks, Uh, but we have to deliberately plan it. We have to, okay, this is the time where we're going to go on a walk and this is the route we're going to go, all of that. If we want to get dinner, we can just order on Seamless or Uber Eats or any of the other countless apps that you can use in order to get food delivered to you. You don't, you could do that with groceries, just get groceries delivered to your door. All of the, like the, the more convenient things become, the less we have to move. And this is really made for a society that values work because why do we want to do less of these tasks less like less going to the grocery store less going out why so we can work more so we can be more productive that's really the crux of it the whole point is that you spend more money to have more convenience so that you can then use that time to make more money is really the vast majority of it so it can be great from an entrepreneurship perspective it can be great from a productivity perspective but from a health perspective i think it's really fucking bad and i don't think it's a surprise that If we look at the longest living populations in the world, it's not entrepreneurs. That's like, it's not people who run their own businesses and and people who work as all day, every day. You you mentioned earlier, it was cool for you to see me like having a little bit more balance. Like it's, it's by design, man. Like I just had my first girl eight months ago and like now more than ever, I just want to be around for as long as possible and not just be around for as long as possible, but have a high quality of life for as long as possible. I want to be 90 years old rolling around with guys in their thirties and forties doing jujitsu and like giving them a real hard time. Yeah. So, so, I mean, that's, that's a real goal of mine. Uh, so, so yeah, it's not my opinion. It's a fact we're moving way less and it's causing some real fucking problems. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was important for me to have you say that on the show because like, I completely agree. Um, it's, it almost is going to sneak up on people. I think they're, they don't realize like what their lack of movement and lack of strength is causing until it gets to a point where it's like, holy shit. And then their health deteriorates dramatically. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I want the best for everybody, but some people, if they don't make drastic changes and really positive changes to their lifestyle, like it's going to snowball. Dude. I literally minutes before you and I started talking, I saw a video online It was a devastating video. It was awful to watch. And fortunately, the ending wasn't as bad as it could have been. But there was a woman who is clearly very overweight with one of her kids in a stroller. And she's bringing the kid to the car. She's unpacking groceries, putting groceries. And the stroller starts rolling away towards a very busy intersection. I saw that too. Yeah. Dude. And as that, as once she realizes it, she starts to try and run towards the stroller and then she falls. Yeah. And she can't get back up. And the stroller just keeps on rolling towards this very busy intersection. And I think she must have been screaming and and someone came over and thankfully caught the stroller right before it went in the busy road. And it just made me very much think about how people often think, oh, well, if I need to, I'll be able to. And it's like, you have no fucking clue. This is why like we need to prepare for the worst. Hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. And and that includes doing hard things, strength training, getting your cardio in. Even, dude, when I would work with people who were very overweight or or brand new to the gym, dude, I would just have them practice getting up, sitting down, getting yep. up, getting down. That's it. Just practice. It takes practice because if they haven't done it in a long time, I mean, and you weigh 300, 400 pounds, that's a lot of fucking weight to get up off the ground. And like, if you just 
If you fall, you scrape yourself and it, it gets even more difficult, a really high stress situation, your heart rate's going up, you're scared, even more difficult. It's one of the reasons why I laugh when I, when people say like, oh yeah, like I don't train any fighting, but I'm really strong. So if I got in that situation, I'd be okay. It'd be like, bro, you have no clue what the fuck you're talking about. Yeah. Like it's, it's everything we do in life is a skill. And if you don't practice the skill, then you're not gonna be able to perform when you need it most. So like basically, if we think about it, strength training, we're preparing for the worst. Cardio, we're preparing for the worst. Jiu-jitsu, we're preparing for the worst. Like saving money, you're preparing for the worst. You're saving money in case, God forbid, you need it. A family member needs it. Like everything we do is like in by our nature is to prepare for the worst. But because life has gotten so easy for those of us who are privileged enough to have more ease in our lives and who live in a in a first world country where things are, are, were paid decently well and you have some extra income. It's like things have gotten so easy. It's, it's, we're not preparing. And when you're not preparing and then the worst happens, you're in deep shit. Yeah. Well, I mean, a thought process that I've had over the past probably year or so, like it started off, my thought process was like, okay, I'm just going to work really, really hard get as much done as I can because it just, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to get myself in a good financial position, maybe at the cost of like my health in some way, like not getting enough sleep or maybe sacrificing my workouts and stuff because I was just like, you know, what's the point? Like, why would I do it any other other way? Because like, I'm a bachelor um, and just living that life where it's like, it doesn't really matter. You have nobody to report to, but then I hit this crossroads and I think a big part of the crossroads was realizing, okay, like the actions that I take now have a huge impact 10 years from now. And oftentimes the comparison that I use is like my fitness career. So I made the transition into the fitness industry in like when I was like around 25 years old and now I'm 31 and an incredible amount of stuff has happened in those five, six years. Like I've gotten to the point where I've started from the ground and got myself up to a point in my career where I'm now like beyond where I had left off with in my prior career. And so if I think about it health wise, if I'm not taking the actions to position myself good for my forties, like I'm not going to get that back. Like if I'm not strength training as though I'm like maybe a parent at age 40 or something, it's not going to matter how hard I try then because I've already like let a lot of things go and already probably suffered from like the, the impacts of a sedentary lifestyle or lack of sleep or anything like that. And then, so then a switch flipped in my brain and I was able to kind of like focus on the things that I was like, I'm like, okay, well, I mean like I'm a sibling to my brothers. They're older than me. They need a younger brother who can kind of like, help him out and talk to him and stuff and be on his A game. I got to be there for my parents. I, I'm an uncle. I got to be there for them. And it was just like by having that sense of purpose and identifying mm -hmm. it, like that's, that's a key thing for specifically for guys. I think guys really like having that sense of purpose where it's like, this is what I do. This is why I do it. But that was huge for me. And then all of a sudden I started like doubling down on the investments in my fit. That's when I started to basically, I tried to go to jujitsu as much as I can, but then I also try to strength train pretty regularly because I find that it helps keep me from getting injured as I learn yeah. technique and stuff. 100%, yeah. And to work on my technique, I've invested in private lessons. So I usually take one of those one a month. Nice. And... Yeah, I got a separate gym membership from the one that I train people out of just so I can be like, okay, I don't know anybody yeah. here. This is my happy space. And I can just mash it out with some machines and just have a really good workout. But it was that mindset shift to not think so much in the here and now, but to actually look at how my actions today can impact the future version of me. Like it's even to the point where for the year of 2023, I've completely cut out alcohol. Um, nice. I don't know how long I'll do that, but so far I'm liking it. Like I just, right now I have a caffeine free diet cola nice. and a carbonated root beer, just in case I run out of the cola, <laughs> but just finding different interventions to keep myself on track. Because it's like, for me, 
I crave a flavored liquid. I crave mm-hmm. carbonation. So I'm like, okay, load up on flavored carbonation. That's zero calories. And it's way better than thinking that you have to fill a void. If you have something available, that's the better option. But yeah, just a long, long tangent. But it's just, I think it's so important for people to see what their future, how their future can be impacted by their actions in their present year, rather than thinking about how their actions now impact tomorrow. Think about how your actions now impact you a decade from now, because it's just like, it's critical. If you don't, like that's where people wait too long to stop smoking. That's where people wait too long to start strength training. That's where people wait too long to start that side hustle or business. I think that's important like for people to have like, just something that fires them up in life. Uh, even if they really like their nine to five, I think you should probably find something that's like exciting and stuff. Yeah. But uh, you always talk about, you want to create that gym that's free for people, right? Mm, yeah. I like that. And I have no doubt that you'll pull it off one day. Um, but I kind of want to hear like the thought process as, you, as you're going through that. Like, do you find that you're getting closer and closer to that point? Do you have like a, a roadmap in, set in place or anything like that? Yeah. So I've never had a roadmap for anything I've ever done. It's very much just been like, let's just wing it and see how it goes. And it's worked out pretty well. Uh, I've had some big failures too, but like overall, I think net it's been very positive. I'm that's just, my personality is not like a planner or roadmap. Like people have always said like, what's your business plan? I don't have a fucking business plan. Like I have no idea. I'm just going to try and help people. Uh, there are a number of reasons why I wanted to, but Louis Simmons was like the real catalyst for me. Uh, Louis Simmons just had a gym that it was a hundred percent free. You could just go and lift there. And like, he gave everyone a key. Like you can just have a key, you go in. And like, he let me go like a, a kid from nowhere brought me in, let me go to the gym. Just, it was just so open and welcoming. There was no gym fees. It was like, yeah, just go in. I just want everyone to lift and learn how to lift. And I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for many people who allowed me into their gym space for free and taught me for free. And, and for me, it's just like, man, if I could open up a space like that, that would help people who are struggling with money, whether it's parents who are struggling with money, they don't have the, the income to pay for a gym membership, or if it's kids who are having a rough time at school and they need something to feel more confident and they want to invest their time and energy, or, you know, God forbid they're, they're, they have a bad home life or they might be getting caught up with the wrong people and they need a different outlet. They don't know what community they like. They can always just come to the gym. Like the, the thing about a, a great gym, and this isn't just a strength training gym, it could be a could be a CrossFit gym, could be a jujitsu academy, could be any type of any of these places, like it's also a community. Yeah. It, it's not just about working out, it's about who you meet there, it's about do you feel safe there? Do you feel welcomed there? Is it a place where you can go and just be yourself? And that that's what I want. And so for the, I've wanted this for about the last twelve years or so. Obviously, this is not something I want to make to make money off of. This is something that I will lose money on. Uh, and in order to get to a point in which I can make this gym and be able to lose a significant amount of money on it, number one, I can't be living in an apartment. So um, we've been living in apartments for the last decade. So once I get a house, then I will have a, uh, that will be the next step, get it, getting a house where I can have my own land and then being able to acquire enough place, enough space that I can then build this and, and outfit it correctly. So if I had to put a number on it, it probably wouldn't be for another 10 years until it's like actually a, a realistic possibility with where I want to be with family and business and all of that. But God willing, in 10 years, I'll be 41. And so plenty of time. Yeah. Start, start at 41, like start a, a gym that's open and available for anybody who wants to come in. I think that's a that would be a great thing for me to accomplish by 41 if I could do that. Yeah, I mean, I have no doubt it is logically sound from my point of view. And I'll kind of give you a little snapshot into my world just to kind of explain some of my thought processes on just like progression through life and stuff. So during 2020 to 2021, there was this Instagram account in Edmonton and they were just giving out prizes. And so it's like, yeah, I'll take your friend in this post and you could win like 200 bucks. And the funny thing is like, there's so many spam accounts like that where everybody was like, no, it's, this is a spam. This is bought, like get out of here. And 
So, so many people were telling this account off and I was like, I don't know. They seem to know some of the local businesses and stuff that I know. So I'll put my name in the hat. And then it was like, it was at a point where I was super freaking broke right before Easter. And I won a prize where it was like $200 cash or something like that. And a gift card to a bar that I worked at, like at the start of my training career. So it was kind of a fun full circle moment. And they offered this like basically a pre-made Easter dinner. So you go and you do like the the curbside pickup and you take your pre-made assembled Easter dinner. And I hop on the Zoom call with my parents and I'm with my family, have my Easter dinner at my house. And it was like, for me, it was nice because somebody made me like an actually good Easter dinner. Because if it wasn't for that, I don't know, I'd probably have pizza or something. Feel so yeah, yeah. Myself. And then since then, I was like, okay, like this is people don't just do this. Like, I want to know who these people are. And so I would stay in contact with these people as best as I could. Um, And as time went on, we'd have like lunch meetups and we'd have brunch meetups. And now like in the years since this has evolved into like-minded entrepreneurial people, mostly between ages of 20 and 40, we just hang out for wings and stuff. And it's people who are like maybe a decade ahead or five years ahead where they've gotten to that level where they can be incredibly philanthropic because they've created a level of wealth where the money that they get from their investments can support their efforts, where they can have like basically what they did during the pandemic. They took a marketing budget from one of their businesses and dedicated it towards giving back to the community. And helping local businesses stay alive. Like uh, the guy that kind of like spearheads it all, he gained like probably 20 pounds because he was supporting so many local bakeries. Like (laughs) go to the bakery or the pizza place. And obviously he'd have some for himself and you go to people's like people in like the Instagram or whatever people who he'd connect with. He just drop off a meal for them because he had this extra food that he picked up. He probably kept like a few dozen businesses alive. That's awesome. Because like his business legacy and these efforts that he had made had compounded to a point where he could do that. And then mm. now we we have this group chat going and it's like if somebody's like somebody's like, I need somebody who sells windows or I need somebody who knows how to do this thing with social media or I know I need somebody who can help lift this heavy printer up a flight of stairs. And so now we're like helping each other out and it's such a grassroots group, but that's given me exposure to see what's possible and to see like what people are capable of. And so I'm like, yeah, it's going to happen. It might take 10 years, but it will happen. And it's just so much opportunity in the times that are tough because like the pandemic was really rough. Like, yeah. um, And everybody had a different view of it. But for myself, I'm always reflecting on like, how grateful I am for the people who have helped me. Uh, one of my things that I do is I often end of a day, I'll think of like, I'll think of people who helped me get certified as a trainer. I'll think of people who put in a good word for me when I apply for a gym. I'll think of my first clients. I'll think of everybody who's mentored me. I'll think of colleagues who hopped on a call. I'll think of like the times you've come on my podcast. And I just, that's my whole identity. I create this whole identity around continuing to remember where I came from, no matter how many years pass in the career. Cause I'm like, I would be nothing if not for these people. Mm. I would not be anywhere if I didn't have all this help. And then it's just from there, I've actually been in a position where I can start giving people help back, which is such Mm -hmm. a good feeling. It's like, you can actually like really bet on people and I can get people booked on other people's podcasts. I can help out with their little side hustles. Just it's such a good infectious feeling that I just, I hope other people get that bug where they're like, yeah, like I'm going to look for the things to be grateful for. I'm going to apply myself to the point where I get these awesome opportunities for myself. And don't just like, we're putting ceilings on ourselves if we don't have this attitude. Where it's like, oh, I guess I'll die now. I I did a pretty good thing. It was pretty good. Or it's like, I couldn't retire early or I can't lift that. I'm like, stop doing that. Like, 
shoot for something awesome. Mm, yeah. Yeah, man. A hundred percent. So to segue us back into jujitsu, cause I'm curious about your competition path. Like what has mm. been the best lesson that you've learned from a competition and what's something that you want to achieve in a future competition? So there's a lot I'd say, I think, one of the best things I've learned is the one I spoke about earlier, which was the nerves are the worst right up until you step on the mat. It's like before you get on, that's when it's the worst. But once you, you get on the mat and you bump hands, the nerves really go away, mm -hmm. which for me, is like a really great thing to know for life in general. Anytime before you do something, that's when you get nervous. But once you start doing it, like the nerves go they're gone pretty quickly. It's just, it's the, 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 it's the waiting. It's like the anticipation. And I think sometimes the anticipation is so much worse because you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself in order to have a certain outcome. And this is the other really important thing that, that jujitsu competitions have helped me learn and understand is that I can't control the outcome. You just, and, and the best way to think about this is we always have a plan when you go into a match or into really anything in life. Uh, but I'm pretty sure it was Sun Tzu who said to the effect of like the plan doesn't doesn't make it past contact with the battlefield or contact with the enemy. Like you have the perfect plan, but as soon as you make contact with the with the enemy or you step on the battlefield, plan changes. Something happens. You got to change it. So you can't control the outcome. You can control your actions, and you can control your preparation. So controlling preparation it's a, a no brainer. But even more specifically. My goal during the match is, is obviously I want to win, but my goal is to try to play my game. So essentially like my, instead of putting the, the goal on like the outcome of like, okay, I need to win in order to be successful. My goal is, can I try to impose my game on the other person? That's it. If I have my game, if I'm like, Hey, I want to try, like, I don't, I don't pull guard, but like, if I was like, Hey, I'm going to pull guard. Like, all right, did I pull guard? Uh, did I do that successfully? Or if like, I I'm a, I tend to be a top player, like going for takedowns. I don't like, I don't like the butt scooting. So like, for me, it's like, all right, I'm going to go try and get a takedown. I don't care if it's a single leg. I don't care if it's a double leg. I don't care if it's a throw. I don't care what, but like, am I going to try and take them down? Maybe I fail, but did I try and do it? As long as I'm trying to impose my game on the other person, then that for me is success because I think it's very easy to get overwhelmed and just almost like to quit before you need to quit and just let the other person play their game. It's like, no, 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 no matter how difficult it gets, I need to try and play my game. And that I think is transferred over into many different aspects of my life as well. Main goal I have right now is uh, I just got my purple belt like a month ago and I just want to compete at purple belt. I was initially going to wait six months. And then my coach called me out on it. He's like, why the fuck are you going to wait six months? He's like, just, and, and I was like, well, I just want to have more experience as a purple belt. And he's like, what you really want to do is you want to get enough experience so that you'll win because that'll make you feel better. He's like, but who cares if you win or lose, just start getting experience now, start competing. So I'm going to, I'm signing up for a competition here in Dallas or in Fort Worth in July. I just want to get competing. I, I think purple belt. I'm a little, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm a little bit nervous to compete at purple belt. Like the the level is is significantly higher. You're starting to really compete with people who've been doing this for a long time. And uh, but that that's my next goal is just compete at purple belt and hopefully not get my knee ripped apart. <laughs> I mean, have you had some pretty debilitating injuries in in your time in jujitsu? Like things that like put you out of training for a few weeks or anything like that. Yeah, I've broke my ribs twice. Uh, I was still, I always was able to train. Even when I broke my ribs, I was actually just talking about this with my buddy. Even when I broke my ribs, it, was, it changed the intensity and changed the specificity of my training. Basically, when I broke my ribs, I couldn't do any guard. No, like I couldn't do any bottom game because any crunching motion, like I, just, I couldn't do it. But I could practice top control. I could practice submissions from top. I couldn't do much passing, just like that crunching down. Like I couldn't do that, but... I got very good at, at, you know, just the basics from top side control, basics from the mount. Uh, I've had some ankle issues as well, but like, I, there's always something, but what I've realized is like, you can always train. Even my buddy, Kevin, he recently just had a real elbow issue and he still comes in. He's a brown belt. He comes in to train. He just tucks his arm into his belt. So he literally just trains with one arm. He can't do anything with his right arm. So he just trains like 
normal, but with his right arm tucked into his belt. Yeah. And I love that. It's just like, you just make do with what you've got. It's not necessarily about winning. It's just about showing up. And so, uh, so yeah, I've had issues with that, but you know, uh, I don't want to, the, the purple belt level, and maybe this, I, I felt the same when I got to blue belt and all of that, but just objectively, factually speaking, by the time you get to purple belt, most people who get to purple, like they've been training for a while and they know what the fuck they're doing. And there's also a difference between gym gym athletes and competitive athletes. There are some people in the gym who don't compete and they're just fucking monsters. But generally speaking, the people who take the time to compete, it's a, it's a little bit of a different level. So I'm, I'm just straight up nervous to compete at purple, but I'm also excited about it. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. Like when I talk to my parents about jujitsu, because they're like, Oh man, I hope you don't get hurt. And I'm like, okay, there's this weird, like mentality to jujitsu and the way I explained it to them, I was like, okay, my exposure to jujitsu is going to impact my day to day, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. The examples where it's been really shitty was like just starting out, I would like bruise my ribs or something. It was just like it hurt to sneeze, it hurt to cough, it hurt to walk, everything hurt, it impacted my day to day, like hurt to get out of bed. But I was like, I would choose over the other extreme where instead of going to a noon jujitsu class, I decided to go party that night. And then I was like hung over and I couldn't think straight. And I, it impacted all my decisions. I'd rather get my ass kicked doing something that was greater than myself, doing something that taught me real life lessons, despite the fact that there is a risk, everything has a risk and that's the risk that I'd bet on. And it's revealed for me some of like the holes in my strength training. I was like, I don't do very much direct core training. And so I just use a machine at Planet Fitness and do a bunch of like machine crunches and just doing little things that I had overlooked for years changed the game for me. And like doing isolated arm training, who would have thought? <laughs> that that would have such a big positive impact. And it's just like, I wouldn't know these things if I didn't have to learn them the hard way. And it's, it's weird. Like not everybody's going to enjoy jujitsu the way you or I enjoy it. Because like sometimes those, those ways that we have to learn the lessons are hard and you just want to quit and then you do. But if you can kind of keep going through it, there's so much to take away from it. And like seeing kids, I love seeing like the posts from my gym, like the social posts where they're showing the kids class. Cause I'm obviously not lurking watching the kids class, but I see it on social and like seeing how they can build the sense of resilience mm. and it's not turning them violent. They're not making them like mean kids. It's making them self-aware. It's making them compassionate. It's making them confident. Um, they don't have to worry about things at school because they've got this new skill set that they can apply to, difference of opinion and nervousness and irritability. Like they can chill, like they get used to that whole, like you say that nervousness before you're going to start like a, a match and they practice that they practice like, okay, relax and focus. And it's like so cool to see that impact on people. Uh, but nevertheless, the final thing that I will bring up on our conversation today is I'm curious do you have things on your three-year bucket list? Because we seem to average maybe two years between episodes or something like that. So if it happens that we're able to reconnect or maybe we see each other at a jujitsu match or something, what do you have in store for the next couple of years? If there was anything that you can think of or anything that might be on your mind that you want to accomplish in that time, share it with me. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch. Obviously, you know, I would love to, God willing, have more kids. <laughs> I'd love to have more kids. And uh, we we have one daughter right now. She just turned eight months and it's just been the greatest blessing ever. So would love to have some more kids over the next, you know, three years, uh, maybe one or two, depending, uh, all God willing. And then I just love to continue to to build my inner circle and my mentorship as well for, for inner circle, just for everyday fitness people. And then for my mentorship for coaches. And then the one thing that I was actually waiting until I got my purple belt for is I want to create a program for jujitsu athletes. I want to create a very low cost, very affordable program 
that is just strength training for jujitsu athletes. And I, I wanted to wait until I got a higher ranking belt because many reasons, but I think specifically in jujitsu, there's a, especially now it's becoming such a fad and so many people are doing it. And I, there's just, there's a lot of people out there who say they train and they don't. And it's like, I see people putting out programs for it and they've never done it. It's like, I wanted to wait until I could call myself like, at least like, I know what the fuck I'm talking about. I get my ass kicked every day still. I'm nowhere near anywhere near, and I'll never be the best in the world at jujitsu. But you combine combine my knowledge of strength and conditioning with my knowledge of jujitsu. And like, I think I'm, I'm in a very small percentage of people who have a lot of experience with both. And I think I can help a lot of a lot of competitors as well, or people who don't compete, people who just like to do jujitsu. So if I if I could do one thing, I actually have a call scheduled tomorrow or the next day about setting up an app for it and just getting the beginning stages going. So hopefully within three years, we'll have a, a jujitsu program out for people that they can follow every month and and jujitsu competitors or people who just jujitsu hobbyists can can learn and, and have a great program made for them. Mm-hmm. I love that. Like that's you bring up the good points with like having to have some skin in the game before doing stuff. And, and another thing that I reflect on, like basically as soon as I start doing the thing, it's like, now it's a fad. Like a lot of people are doing it by the time. Cause I'm usually pretty slow to like jump <laughs> on the bandwagon. Um, so I was like, okay, this isn't, this isn't special anymore. Once I've entered the, the arena, now a lot of people are doing it. The um, thing is, as long as you don't treat it like a fad, I think it's the most important thing. I see, I know for a fact, there's just this one person that keeps popping up in my mind. I'm not going to say their name or give any indication as to who they are, but they're they're pretty big on social media and they just started training li- literally two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, they started training jujitsu and they've already made a number of pieces of content online talking about how they train jujitsu every day. And I'm just like, you just started two and a half weeks ago and yeah. like the vast majority of your content has been how you train martial arts every single day it's like you've done it two and a half give it some fucking time like say yeah. you started but like don't make it seem like you've been training for years and you do it every single day like oh it's just it's that's the frustrating part and that's where i never wanted to come across like that i wanted to have a lot of time and a, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of hours under my belt, literally and figuratively before I came out and said, Hey, I think I can actually help you people. So uh, that that's why I've wanted to wait until I got my purple belt. And it still probably won't happen for a while. Cause now I've got to get the whole systems and everything built. But this is something I was very excited about in terms of once I, I reached that level, I wanted, I, I'll feel comfortable enough to make this program. And I'm at that point where I think I do. Well, I mean, the best comparison that I have for that, that person that you described is like people who start a podcast and like, this is the best podcast ever. And it's like, they're <laughs> like eight episodes and then they're done and they don't even keep the episodes up. They scrap all the yeah. episodes. <laughs> but yeah, with that said, if somebody wanted to connect with your mentorship or join your inner circle or anything that you have on the go, would they just go to your social media or do you have an easier way for them to kind of get set up with that? I, you know, I would say email me Jordan at site fitness.com S Y A T T fitness.com. And if you want to, if you're a coach and you want to learn more about how to build your online business, that's my mentorship. Just mention my mentorship. If you are just a regular fitness enthusiast and want to strength train and work out, ask about the inner circle. And if you are a jujitsu athlete and you want more to know more about that program, well then follow me on social because it doesn't exist yet, but I will be announcing on social when it does exist. Mm -hmm. And years from now, this episode will still be up. So maybe it'll be up by then, but with that said, thank you so much for making time for me today, Jordan. It's been really great to be able to connect with you again. Likewise, brother. It's amazing to see how well you're doing and to continue to catch up with you. So keep up the amazing work. And I hope I get to see you at a jujitsu competition soon. Totally.